Welcome to the Water Network series of expert interviews. My name is Marina Zielkovic and today I'm talking to Angus Webb, the senior lecturer at the University of Melbourne and one of the editors of the book Water for the Environment from Policy and Science to Implementation and Management. Welcome. Thank you. Would you start by telling us something about your book? Yeah, sure. Um, so what if the environment is, um, well, we think it's the the first book that really tries to tackle the entire um, life cycle of environmental water management. So in the past, there's been quite a few specialist textbooks about either environmental water science or environmental water law or policy. But um, environmental water really is one of these wicked problems where uh, there's a a great deal of different disciplines need to fit together to uh, reach effective solutions. And so we saw a, a real need for a book that really cut across uh, uh, policy, law, economics, engineering, uh, ecology, hydrology, and all the various um, disciplines that go to make up the environmental water management cycle. And that's what we've ended up with. Okay, uh, who is the book made for? Uh, it's primarily aimed at managers. Um, there are a lot of scientists working in the environmental water space, but uh, and I'm one of them, um, but we don't get to make the decisions. We don't get to implement environmental water programs. So primarily in government agencies, there are a lot of people um, who are tasked with um, putting together and implementing environmental water programs. And a lot of them don't have uh, the overview that we feel is necessary to do this um, effectively. And so the book is aimed at providing a, a high level picture of all of these different aspects of the environmental water management um, conundrum. Uh, and anybody who's interested can then sort of delve further into those uh, various uh, areas um, through the literature. Do you think that the future of environmental water management lies in collaboration between experts or do you think we lack the technology and need to improve it? I think, I think it's a bit of both. I think uh, we need to progress both areas. Um, one thing that has been uh, happening in the past is there's been a very strong science focus on environmental water management and environmental water science. And there's some really good technology that is being developed and being used. Um, we've got people in our department who are trying to use um, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, to collect data um, to replace some of the older methods that we've been using for a long time. And we're also using mathematical optimization to help design flow regimes. But environmental flows won't work unless you are fully engaged with the, the local community, the managers who have to uh, make the decisions and implement them and, and live with the consequences, uh, and the scientists, the researchers who can come up with these bright ideas. So it's, it's, a, it's the whole picture. We need all groups working effectively together. Okay. Um, could you tell me something about the reform process in Australia? Oh, the water reform process. Um, it's, uh, it's been a long process. Um, we had a major drought here between about 1997 and 2010. It became known as the uh, Millennium Drought. And while that drought did cause a lot of environmental damage and economic damage, social damage too, um, Australia actually got through it better than a lot of people would have expected. And when California started to experience drought conditions uh, a few years ago, there was a, a bit of a rush to come to Australia and ask us how we'd gotten through the drought, um, what rapid action had gotten us through the drought. The answer really lies in a process that began in 1994, so some years before the drought began, which was uh, the Commonwealth Council of Australian Government's water reform process. Um, that process was pretty complicated, but the two major things that it did was um, it unbundled water rights from property rights. So previously, if you bought a block of land alongside a river, there was a water right to pump. Um, what the water reform process allowed people to do was to own the land, but sell the water either permanently or temporarily. The other thing that started happening was that uh, users, primarily farmers, irrigators, uh, had 
to start paying higher prices for water, pay a, a true price for the cost of the upkeep of the infrastructure, uh, which previously had been very heavily subsidised by the government. Um, now, those two things operating together meant that uh, farmers in particular started using water a lot more efficiently uh, because it was costing more and they had more ways they could use it or get financial return. And so a few years later, environmental water started to become um, a bigger deal uh, and it was subject to the same rules and the same restrictions as, um, as agricultural water. And so that learnt started to sorry, that that watering started to become more efficient as well. Um, so, yes, we did get through the drought better than we expected, um, but it wasn't because of rapid decisions taken during the drought. It was really the, the reform process that allowed us to react during the drought. So any countries sort of facing similar situations in future need to start to get that architecture in place before the crisis hits in the first place which is easy to say, but um, difficult to do. Okay. Uh, what are some of the best response strategies in water management? Could you give some examples? There's a species of fish called the golden perch, which is a, an iconic native fish species. And it has the, um, the property that it tends to only reproduce um, when there's high flow events coming through. Um, and over a number of years, we've learned quite a lot about the, the timing and the volume of flow required and also the fact that it needs to be once uh, spring has uh, spring has or well, late in spring when water temperatures are warmer. Uh, and that's when we see the fish moving downstream and reproducing. And over the years, we've gotten quite good at actually being able to induce that um, that reproductive response in this, in this species. Uh, that's real, been a real success story out of that particular program. Um, and there are other examples uh, springing up around the Murray-Darling Basin in Australia and elsewhere in the world as well. Um, could you tell me something about the adaptive management of environmental flows and how it changes with practice? Mm, certainly. Well, that example I just gave you was really adaptive management in action because it did take us um, several years before we uh, really understood the processes that were needed to get these golden perch to, um, to, to spawn and to reproduce. Um, so adaptive management is really learning by doing. Um, environmental water is it's quite a young field and so we've got uh, this tremendous resource, this huge amounts of water that we need to use but we don't know that much about how they might uh, actually cause ecological responses. And um, so we're operating from a position of quite some uncertainty. Um, what we're faced with is having to make decisions. No decision is not an option. We can't just sit back. Uh, the main thing is once we make a decision, let's good, good monitoring and evaluation in place so that we can learn what happens as a result of that, such that the next time we come to make a similar decision, we do a, a better job. So the main thing about learning from the past is actually documenting it um, and making sure that we understand what we've learned and getting those learnings, those lessons um, out to the wider community as well um, and out to other environmental water management projects too. What would you say are the biggest challenges of, of environmental water management? Um, well, there's plenty, um, and it's a, it's a nice prompt, actually, because the final chapter in the book um, was one where we um, we ran a, what's called a horizon scanning exercise. So myself and the other editors, um, I haven't actually mentioned the other editors yet, and I really should, um, so Avril Horn and Michael Stewardson, who are from my department at the University of Melbourne, um, and also Brian Richter from uh, previously from the Nature Conservancy in the in the US, and Mike Ackerman from the um, uh, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology in the UK. We ran a process where we got uh, we sent out an online survey to water managers, water professionals, water scientists, and got them to nominate um, what they believed the biggest questions in the uh, for were for the future. Um, and then we ran a workshop to try to um, boil down those questions into a smaller number. 
And look, we still end up with quite a few, uh, but one that I, I particularly like um, and I think is really worth mentioning is the fact that environmental water management to date has mostly been done in developed countries. And in developed countries, we've got good legislative frameworks, we've generally got good infrastructure, and we've got good information about the rivers and what lives in them. So the question, one of these key questions really is how do we translate environmental water management into a developing country situation so that hopefully as these countries develop, we can help them to avoid some of the water management mistakes that have been made in the developed world over recent or over past decades and which we're now trying to make up for with um, restoring environmental flows. How do we actually help them to put sustainable water management in place in the first place? And what do you think are some of the most important long-term water policy issues? Uh, I think it's mostly about getting the, the legislation right. Um, so environmental water management is an idea that has appealed to a lot of governments from around the world. And there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of policies that have been developed to deliver environmental water. It's only now that we're starting to see large scale environmental water programs actually being rolled out in different countries around the world. So the Murray-Darling Basin Plan in Australia um, is probably the biggest. We, uh, we're trying to return 20% um, of the, the water previously used for irrigation to the environment. And we're doing it across the scale of the whole Murray-Darling Basin, which is about 15% of the area of Australia. Uh, now that's the flagship program really still on a world scale. We don't see that many programs like this being rolled out because the, the, the policy frameworks, the, the legislative environment, um, it doesn't, yet exist that will allow um, these programs to take shape. Um, there's been a bit of research into this um, and it's, it's mostly about governments being willing to, um, to, to sort of take that leap of faith um, and start to implement these programs and to develop the, the networks of, um, of managers, of policy makers, of legislators to, to get these programs in place. Um, ironically, as a scientist, a lack of scientific knowledge is really not the major barrier here. It is about getting the policy settings right. And water sustainability is an often mentioned topic. What mm -hmm. is it exactly and how do we achieve it? Well, water is a, a limiting resource. Um, we, we need water to live as humans. There's, um, there's no getting around that, and I, I wouldn't try to. Um, but the environment needs water as well. Um, there's been a few big studies where you see maps of where water stress is the greatest for the environment. The, the water security threat is also the greatest for human populations. So it's really about um, efficient use of the resource. Um, efficient use of water for both human consumption and that's mostly through irrigation and agriculture that's where humans use most of their water but then also efficient use for environmental purposes as well um, environmental flows science has been um, dominated by a, a paradigm a way of thinking if you like known as the, the natural flow regime um, over the last 20 years or so and <clears throat> that's a it was a paper that suggested that we needed to try to emulate natural flow regimes with peaks and troughs and different timings of flow um, to, to help the environment. And that's been tremendously successful. But recently, um, a new idea known as designer flows has also arisen, where we're actually specifically engineering flow regimes to try to achieve specific um, environmental outcomes. Uh, and that example I talked about earlier with spawning in the golden perch is, um, is one of these where we're delivering a flow event at a, at a specific time of year when we know that the water is warm enough um, specifically to achieve this, this uh, it response. 
if we were just following when the natural peaks would occur, that would only occur maybe one in two or three years. So sustainability is a very difficult topic, um, but for me, um, sustainable water use boils down to efficient use. Thank you. So finally, where can people find your book? Um, well, it's it's available online. Um, so it's available through the uh, through major online retailers such as uh, Google Books and Amazon, um, or you can go directly to the um, Elsevier website. So that's um, www.elsevier.com, um, and search for the book title. Um, I did set up a shortcut, which is uh, what is it? It's um, www.tinyurl.com slash water for the environment. Um, there's also a rather nice ad for it on the Water Network. Um, so if you go to the Water Network site there, you'll be able to find a, an ad for it, uh, which also includes a flyer with more information on the publication. Um, and if you've got a, a very particular interest, you can get individual chapters um, through uh, Elsevier's Science Direct platform. So it's available electronic form and also in hard copy. I think the hard copy is much nicer. <laughs> Finally, would you have something to add? Um, no, not really. I think, uh, look, I, I hope this book is, is a useful contribution to, um, to environmental water science and management uh, and particularly keeping the conversation going around the world. We did manage to engage with a lot of people for this book. So there were five of us editing, but 54 other authors um, from all around the world. And as I started out by saying, crossing a huge range of disciplines, uh, and we, we're really indebted to the effort that these people put in to, to come up with what we think is um, really quite a, a special publication. Thank you.